So yesterday, uh, Coal Cracker Bushcraft, Dan Wolwack put up a video, and uh, I'll put a link to that in the description below. But uh, Dan put up a video on his five items every bushcrafter needs. And uh, his five items were a knife, a flint and steel kit, cordage, a needle kit, and a pot. Okay, now we would expect that uh, many of anyone's top five items are going to fall within those commonly called five C's. And uh, today I'm going to give my own five that I think every beginner maybe should have. And just to qualify this, for me, um, something like a Bic lighter or matches, things that are commonly found within somebody's home, I'm not going to include on the list. I'm just going to figure that you already have access to some of those things, so I'm not going to put it on the list. What I'm going to focus on are things that are more bushcraft specific that a beginner may not have. So stay with me and I'm going to give a video response to Coal Cracker Bushcraft and at the end of this video I'm going to tag two people who have been on YouTube for a very very long time. One of them has been on YouTube for over 10 years. The other one a good solid eight years. Now me, I just started a few months ago, so I'm the new guy on the block. Stay tuned. Okay, so first of all, uh, Dan's, uh, Dan's first thing is a knife. And I'm going to recommend something like this Mora HD Companion. All right. Um, I'm trying to be budget friendly here. Okay, now some people might have, you know, an old hickory butcher knife or something like that in the house already that they could use. That's fine. Um, but I think most beginners uh, you don't have a good bushcrafting type knife. You know, you're not going to go in your kitchen drawer and grab a, a butter knife and run out in the woods. You, you want a knife that at least you can do some light of batoning with. And I don't want to get into the whole debate on whether we should you know, baton or not. I do. I think it's a good thing to know how to do. But something like, you know, a cheap $20 or so Mora uh, HD companion is just fine. You know, $10, $12 Old Hickory, just fine. Um, for me, my normal bushcraft knife, let me grab this out here. Now this I got on sale for a hundred bucks. This is a bushcrafter from uh, Battle Horse Knives. And uh, just to be clear, when Wowak Cold Cracker did his video, it said five items, okay? But as you know, a knife is one item, a sheath could be counted as another item. I'm going to look at things in terms of you know, kits, just like Cold Cracker did. When he listed his knives or uh, his needles, there were multiple needles. There was a needle carrier. When he did cordage, he mentioned three or four different kinds of cordage. Um, so I'm, I'm not being entirely strict on the word item. Okay, so. A knife and a sheath counts as one item. Now, uh, for his uh, second item, Cole Cracker did flint and steel. Again, that's not one item, right? Your you flint is one item and a steel is another. We're going to look at it as a kit. Now, in my opinion, A flint and steel kit should include some sort of bag or container, okay? 
Now this is uh, one of my kits. I'm going to show a few of them. Okay. We've got this kit right here. And it's got everything I need in it to make a fire with flint and steel. But this is not really a char tin per se. So what I like to do is make my char, you know, once a season or as often as I need to and keep a whole bunch of char at home so that I can just put it in here. But you should have as well as your flint and steel kit that may or may not include a bag. Uh, you should also have a char tin that's part of that kit whether you whether you carry the tin that you make char in or not. Let's see I've got mine right here right and I, I usually just leave this at home unless I'm going out to make char cloth okay. Now another flint and steel kit I've got is right here I just actually just got this the pouch was from uh, Badger Claw, and this is one of those Hudson Bay tins. And, um, you know, this has got everything in it. This actually is Kapok. I got this from uh, Mark and Helen over at uh, Beaver Bushcraft in the UK. They got a lot of good stuff. But uh, anyway, here's another flint and steel kit. Now this particular kit also has a magnifying glass in it, which is also uh, kind of fun. Let's see, I've got another you know, flint and steel kit in here. This, uh, this pouch I got from MCQ Bushcraft over in the UK. And uh, what I particularly like about it is that when I'm processing tinder, I can process it over this pouch so that the little fine dust and all that falls inside. And uh, I've got ridiculously fine dust in here because of that. So again, it's not necessarily just one item, but a, a kit. And in that kit, I've got that nice pouch from MCQ. In this kit, I've got uh, the real striker designed by Jamie Burley. I got this in the December Apaca box from Creek Stewart. But, uh, you know, just another flint and steel kit. And the reason why I was I was talking to Jamie Burley, um, the co-founder of the Old World Alliance, uh, yesterday on the phone, and I was telling him about uh, me including flint and steel on this list, and he basically started yelling at me. <laughs> he's he's a good guy, but uh, he's like, why not a Bic lighter? And so I'm going to respond to that. Why not a Bic lighter? Well, like I said earlier, things that you're already going to have in the home that aren't you know, bushcraft specific, I'm sort of keeping off the list. Um, yes, by all means, have a lighter. Have lots of them. Uh, have one in your pocket. Have one in your haversack. Have one. Have one everywhere. Um, but as far as bushcraft goes, if you're a beginner and you don't have any bushcraft gear and you want to be able to go out in your backyard, we're not talking about a survival situation here. We're talking about trying to go out into the woods in your backyard or what have you where it's you're safe and close to home, it's not a survival situation, and you just want to practice and learn some skills. Uh, flint and steel teaches you a lot, right? I mean, you learn how to char material. You learn how to take an ember and, and build a bird's nest, right? And then put the ember in the bird's nest, which also is the process for bow drill. You get the ember a different way, but if, if you try to do bow drill and you don't know how to take an ember and put it in a good 
a bird's nest and, and you don't know, you know, do you let the wind help you? Do you, you know, fan it a little bit to get some more oxygen when it's, you know, you're smoking a lot, um, you know, keeping it up. There, there's all these, you know, you, uh, paying attention to the smoke. Is it smoking a little or a lot? When that smoke starts to get you know, thick and yellowy, you know it's about to catch flames. There's a lot that you can learn. And, and, and now that it's caught flames, okay, now you've got a fire. Do you have a proper fire lay? Do you have enough materials? <clears throat> you know, it's not good enough just to get a bird's nest into flames. You've got to carry that on so that you have a, a, a good you know, fire. And is that for heat? Is it for cooking? Is it right? All of those things you can have a lot of fun doing with flint and steel. So part of it is just it's fun. I actually had a conversation. Uh, I had the privilege of going camping with Joe Robinette before he was um, before the season of Alone aired, after it was videoed, but before it aired. And Joe Robinette said that, uh, I'm not trying to get you in, in, in trouble, Joe. Um, I, I had said flint and steel was my favorite way to uh, start fires, and he said that, that uh, flint and steel is a gimmick. And I kind of argued with him about that, but there is some truth to it. It is kind of a gimmick. I mean, who in their right mind these days would go out you know, in a real survival situation or whatever with flint and steel. I mean, I'd want pick lighters, I'd want a ferrocerium rod, I'd, you know, I guess your flint and steel can last a long time if you have a source of good flint, but, but it's fun. It's fun. So that's why I have it on my list. You can learn a lot, plus it's fun. And if it's fun, it's more encouraging to learn that way. So there you go. Uh, now let's get into my number three. Now, Cole Cracker left this off the list. He said that he prefers an ax and a pocket knife over even a belt knife. And he left a saw off the list, but I'm gonna put a saw on the list. Mine is right here. I still am a Baco Laplander guy. And, um, you know, I guess maybe some people have a saw in their garage or if you got a barn or whatever. You might actually have something like this. Uh, but a good dedicated bushcraft saw. Um, everything on my list basically has a fire application. And because fire is so vitally important, um, I think... A saw is a good way to go for a beginner. It's a lot safer than using an axe. And between a belt knife like this and a saw, you can process a lot of wood. So I'm going to put a saw on as number three. Uh, whether it's a silky saw or <clears throat> a Baco Laplander, uh, whether it's a bigger buck saw type thing, I've got a Agawa Canyon Boreal 21 that I like a lot, but as far as a beginner, you know, you can get these for just over 20 bucks thereabouts on Amazon. Good solid saw. So that would be number three. Now number four, you know, Cold Cracker had cordage on his list. I'm going to put it on there too because especially having been a Cub Scout and a Boy Scout. I, I learned a lot of knots. I remember one year at a Klondike event, I got a whole bunch of uh, points for for our troop uh, because I had a good knowledge of knots. And so I'm going to recommend, here's that number 36 bank line that a lot of us are familiar with. This is a big spool. Here's a little one. Okay, so I definitely recommend that. I, I also prefer two different sizes of jute. I use this thick jute, um, mostly for 
uh, bird's nests, I suppose, but also it's, it's when I do Civil War reenacting, this is something that I can get away with, you know, pretty easily using for a variety of different things. Uh, but I also like the little style jute, you know, you know, tying up little things. Uh, that works real well. And of course, there's the paracord. Uh, 550 cord. What I like to do is uh, I've got it on this S beaner and uh, Jamie Burley taught me a cool trick years ago. I think it was on the uh, Self-Reliance Outfitters uh, um, YouTube channel. What he said was when you get a hundred feet of paracord, so uh, fold it in half and now you've got 50 feet. Cut it Okay, and now that hundred feet is broken down into two fifties. Okay, now fold one of those fifties in half and cut it, and you've got two twenty fives. Okay, so put those two twenty fives off to the side. Now you've got two twenty five pieces. Okay, take the other fifty foot that's left. Okay, fold that in half, cut it. You got two twenty fives. Okay. Take each of those 25s, fold it in half, cut it. You've got two 12 and a halves, okay? Take the two 12 and a halves, put it off to the side. Take the other two 12 and a halves that are left, fold those, cut them, and now you've got four that are just over six feet, okay? Then what we do is Normally I keep a bowline knot at the end of them. Not all of them, but a lot of them, especially the ridge lines. And what I'll do to keep my cordage organized is I'll take this, I'll fold it in half and quarter it and do it again, do it a, a couple times. And then I'll just make an overhand knot just like this put that through and now my cordage not real tight and then with these loops at the end I just put that on my S beaner and I've got all these different lengths of cordage all ready to go they're all tied up with those overhand knots some of them as you can see this one already has uh, prussics on it and everything for ridge lines so cordage cordage is so useful and it relates to fire because if you're going to hang a pot over you know build a tripod you're going to lash it wraps and fraps with let's say bank line then you're going to want to uh, you know carry um, have something hanging down that you can hold your pot with um, you know even even this is my my chain kit. I've got chains and hooks in here. And I kind of consider that part of my cordage kit too because what is a chain? See, I've got some S hooks in here. S hooks. But I've got various lengths of chain, which chain is basically cordage too. It's just metal cordage. And uh, I've got some rings in here so I can make a real fast tripod and I've got the little S hooks and chain. But that's all to make cooking easier, you know, safer and, and all that sort of thing. So normally when I'm doing uh, you know, camping, especially with reenacting, I'll have this leather bag that's just got chains and uh, S hooks and some rings in it. Not technically cordage, but I thought I'd just mention it while I'm mentioning cordage. So I've got one thing left, one item left, right? So far I did a knife, I did a flint and steel kit, I did a saw, I just mentioned cordage. Number five is where I think some people are going to push back. Now I thought about this and I thought, you know, I could... I could include this in the flint and steel kit and maybe get away with it if I, well, I get to make up the rules as my video. 
but I thought, no, I really want this to be its own item. And that is a tinder pouch. Now this is a, a heavy duty leather one from Randy at Stitched Gear. And um, this is what I usually put uh, enough in there that if I absolutely 100% need to get a fire going, this is gonna have everything I need for an emergency. Um, now, you can also use a littler pouch like this one from from uh, Badger Claw Outfitters, but that's not going to hold a whole lot. But you could put some tinder in there. Sure you could. Sure you could. But let me show you one of my first uh, tinder pouches. Now actually this one is my wife's. It's got pink, pink paracord. But what she did was she took a pair of pants jeans and just cut off the leg sewed up the bottom made a pouch right now mine actually has one of the butt pockets on the inside and uh, now of course this is not waterproof the cotton from the jean material is going to absorb water you know but it's also breathable so your tinder can breathe it can dry out in here it's not going to hold the moisture in um, this just has Right now it's got a bunch of pine straw or pine needles. But, you know, maybe you make yourself something like this. It, it, this can hold a lot. But my point in, in, in saying my, for my you know, fifth item, a tinder pouch, is because all this talk about how fire is so important and all that, you need you need tinder you need to be looking you need to and, and and if you have a job specific item right i believe in having the proper tool for the job now i think tools should be as multifunctional as possible but at the same time i believe in having the proper tool for the job and having a dedicated tinder bag that when you go out into the backyard you go out into the woods you go out to do this hobby called bushcraft even if you're not planning on starting a fire, like I'm not planning on starting a, a fire today, but I've gathered tinder today. Why? Because I have a dedicated tinder pouch that sort of reminds me, hey, what's this thing for? Oh, I'm supposed to be out here collecting tinder so that when I need it, I've got it. And I think having that item helps to promote looking and collecting and being prepared so that when you need that tender it's there for you so anyway that's my list we've got a knife a flint and steel kit a saw cordage and a tinder pouch so i'm curious if you agree with me what you think if you disagree uh, what your five items might be and again my rules for me were if it's something that you could just find in the house, which by the way, I guess you could just use a plastic bag as a tinder pouch. I did that today. I mean, I've got some, you know, you know, kindling in here too, but, but I've got a bunch of tulip poplar that I found. Well, the, the, the kindling's tulip poplar, but I found a bunch of the tulip poplar bark. And you can use a plastic bag, I suppose, but, you know, I don't know. If you actually have a dedicated tinder pouch, you know, I, I can forget to grab a plastic bag. But if I got a tinder pouch as part of my kit, I'm probably not going to forget it because it's part of my kit. So, anyway, honorable mention. The sixth item if you will, is something to put all the other items in, right? Whether it's a haversack, a little backpack. Today I've got a Continental Rucksack from L.L. Bean. But you, you want a container to put your things in, right? So not going to include that on the list, but uh, something to put all your stuff in to, so that it's all in one place. You can just grab it and go. So I said at the beginning of the video that I was going to tag two people. One of those people, I said, 
has been on YouTube for over 10 years. And that individual, someone who has a wealth of knowledge, specifically when it comes to traditional, historic firearms, especially, but the dude's got skills. The dude's been around for a long time. He's a good guy. You know him. If it's Tuesday, it's time for Down and Dirty Bushcraft, Blackie Thomas. And up here, I'm going to put some pictures from Blackie going all the way back to his first YouTube video, at least what's on there now, from 10 years ago. And my number two tag for today, someone who's been on YouTube for a solid eight years, one of the funniest guys out there. Great personality. This guy does cooking videos like nobody's business. This guy always has not just a knife, but a machete and a knife. The king of the double sheath. The king of the crazy improvised shelters. None other than really big monkey one and here I've got pictures of him going back to his first video and these two gentlemen also fellow instructors with the old world alliance what business do I have being on YouTube for just a couple months do I have being able to contact these guys Blackie Thomas and Dave Pearson really big monkey one send them a message and Within minutes or, or an hour, same day, they contact me back. Why is that? Because we are instructors with the Old World Alliance. If you're interested in seeing more content from the Old World Alliance, check out jointheowa.com. But I tag these OWA instructor brethren to do their own video on what they think are the top five items that every beginning bushcrafter needs and y'all can set your own parameters as far as like I did with a you know big knife or if a knife and a sheath you know counts for one item or two y'all big boys do your own thing and I sure am looking forward to seeing what y'all come up with and why now you might imagine that many of us are gonna have a knife if not all of us are gonna have a knife on that list but what, what, maybe what kind of knife or, you know, all of our lists aren't going to be exactly the same. Why are they, why are they different? Why did we choose what we chose? It'll be interesting to see where we're the same. And it might be more interesting to see where we are different. So until next time, this is Jamie Schmotzer. I'm an herbalist and instructor for the Old World Alliance. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.